it's very unlikely to get preserved DNA out of bone that has been cremated. When scientists finally gained access to the supposed remains of Joan of Arc, the findings from a DNA analysis revealed a truth that would fundamentally alter the accepted narrative of her death. For more than 100 years, these artifacts had been displayed in a French museum, revered by visitors as a tangible link to the past. However, a forensic examination using advanced technology uncovered something far more unsettling than anyone could have predicted. This is the story of Chalier's quest to find the truth behind the relics that could be Saint Joan of Arc. And this evidence would force historians to question everything they thought they knew about how the Maid of Orléans really died. The story begins in 1867, during a routine inventory check at a Parisian pharmacy. Hidden away in a dusty attic was an ordinary glass jar with an extraordinary age-yellowed label that read, Remains found under the pyre of Joan of Arc, Maiden of Orléans. For many years, this jar remained in relative obscurity before being transferred to the Archbishop of Tours in Chinon, France. The contents, a collection of charred, blackened fragments, appeared consistent with the brutal execution of Joan in 1431. Museum visitors would gaze at what they believed were the last physical traces of France's most celebrated heroine. However, a significant contradiction lay at the heart of this discovery. According to historical records, Joan of Arc's body was burned not once, but three times. The English, fearing her influence even in death, ensured her remains were reduced to ash and then scattered into the River Seine. Their intention was clear. Nothing of Joan of Arc was to be left behind. So how could these remains have possibly survived? The glass jar itself dated back to the late 17th century, over 200 years after Joan's death. This discrepancy alone should have raised alarms, but the power of collective belief was immense. France and its people needed these relics to be real. As Fabrice Masson, the curator of Chignon's historical museum noted, their significance went far beyond their physical nature. They had become powerful symbols of Jean's enduring legacy. In the early 2000s, a remarkable team gathered in Paris to solve this centuries-old mystery. At its head was Philippe Charlier, a forensic pathologist who assembled 22 of Europe's leading experts. This was no ordinary research group. It included medical examiners, pathologists, geneticists, biochemists, a radiologist, a zoologist, and an archaeologist. Their shared mission was to determine, once and for all, if the remains in the jar belonged to Joan of Arc. They were equipped with the most advanced forensic tools available, including DNA analysis, various forms of microscopy, chemical analysis, and carbon dating. The stakes were incredibly high. Joan of Arc is more than a historical figure. She is a saint, a symbol of French resistance, and a feminist icon. Her legacy is claimed by political parties across the spectrum, from the nationalist right to feminists who celebrate her defiance of gender norms. For Catholics, she is a martyr whose faith remained unshaken even in the face of death. If these were her authentic remains, it would provide tangible proof of one of history's most extraordinary lives. However, as the examination began, early observations raised concerns. The fragments did not look like cremated human remains from the 15th century should. The black coating on the bones had an unusual composition, and the DNA was about to reveal a startling truth about her death, or rather, what we assumed was her death. As the team carefully catalogued the jar's contents, they identified several key items, an approximately four inch long human rib covered in a black substance, part of a cat femur with the same coating, three charcoal-like fragments, and a brownish piece of textile. Many different methods of analysis to determine whether, in this case, relics belong to Joan of Arc. The presence of a cat bone immediately sparked discussion. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft, the very charge used to condemn Joan. Some historians speculated that a cat might have been thrown onto her pyre as a symbolic act. This theory fit the historical narrative, perhaps too well. But scientific analysis is not concerned with storytelling. Geneticists quickly found that the DNA preservation in the human rib was remarkably good, far too good for remains that were supposedly burned in 1431. The cellular structure of burned bones collapses in predictable ways, and the DNA degrades accordingly. 
These bones showed none of those patterns. Instead, they appeared to have been carefully preserved, not violently destroyed. Microscopy results deepened the mystery. The black coating was not residue from a wood fire. Its uniform application suggested it was deliberately applied as a preservation agent, not the result of a chaotic burning. The evidence was pointing away from Joan of Arc's execution and towards something far stranger. In any scientific investigation, there are moments when a single result can overturn decades of belief. The carbon dating analysis of the remains was one such moment. The results were staggering. The human rib and the cat femur were not from the 15th century. Both the human rib and the cat femur were coated in a complex organic compound mixture. They dated back to a period between the 6th and 3rd centuries BC, nearly 2,000 years before Joan of Arc was even born. These relics were ancient when the Roman Republic was still in its infancy. This revelation sent shockwaves through the research team. For over a century, people had prayed over these fragments. The Catholic Church itself had examined them in 1909 before Joan's beatification and cautiously declared them probably hers. That single word now seemed like a monumental understatement. This discovery revealed something profound. We have absolutely no physical evidence of what happened to Joan of Arc's body. The historical accounts were now open to question. Furthermore, it raised a new mystery. Why would someone create such an elaborate forgery centuries after her death? The evidence now pointed to a deliberate deception, but the motive was still unclear. The investigation took another unexpected turn when chemical analysis identified the components of the mysterious black coating. It was a complex mixture of bitumen, wood resins, and gypsum. The team also discovered pine pollen consistent with resins used in ancient Egyptian embalming. Further analysis of the textile scrap revealed that its fibers and weaving pattern matched mummy wrappings from Egypt's Ptolemaic period. The chemical signature was undeniable. The coating was an embalming product used to preserve the dead for the afterlife. This was a forgery constructed from genuine ancient Egyptian mummy parts. But how did Egyptian remains find their way into a French pharmacy? The answer lies in a grim aspect of medieval medical history. For centuries, fragments of Egyptian mummies were not treated as artifacts, but were ground into a powder called mummia and sold as medicine. This powder was believed to possess powerful healing properties and was prescribed for everything from bruises to the plague. The trade was widespread, with apothecaries importing mummy parts by the ton. It now made sense that these remains had been stored as medical supplies in the pharmacy attic, their original purpose long forgotten before being repurposed in the 19th century as something far more valuable, the sacred relics of France's greatest saint. In the 1860s, France was a nation in search of unity and identity. Still feeling the sting of military defeats and facing political instability under Napoleon III, Napoleon III's Second Empire faltered, weakened by crushing military defeats and deepening political unrest across France. The country was in desperate need of heroes and Joan of Arc was the perfect symbol of French resilience and courage. The timing of the relic's discovery in the Parisian pharmacy was no coincidence. It was perfectly aligned with the political climate. The late 19th century saw a massive resurgence of interest in her story. She was being reimagined as the embodiment of French heritage and resistance against foreign invaders. Her image became a powerful tool for promoting nationalism. In this atmosphere of reverence, someone recognized an opportunity. Using unwanted Egyptian medical supplies from the pharmacy's stock, it would not have been difficult for someone with pharmaceutical knowledge to create convincing-looking relics. They used an authentic 17th century jar and an aged-looking label to lend credibility to their claim. The deception worked because people wanted to believe. What is truly unsettling is not just that one person was fooled, but that generations of church officials, historians, and museum curators accepted these fragments as genuine without rigorous scientific testing. This elaborate hoax raises a difficult question. If we were so wrong about her remains for so long, what else about her life and death might we have misunderstood? With the forgery exposed, we are left with the historical account. Joan of Arc's body was intentionally and thoroughly destroyed. Her body was destroyed, yet her spirit endured, 
defying the very fire meant to erase her. The English understood the power of relics and were determined to prevent any part of her from becoming a symbol for French resistance. After her execution by burning on May 30th, 1431, they reportedly burned her remains two more times to ensure nothing identifiable was left. Contemporary accounts, written exclusively by her English captors, claim her heart miraculously refused to burn. Finally, they gathered all the remaining ashes and threw them into the Seine, ensuring there would be no grave to visit and no bones to venerate. The extreme nature of these three cremations is unusual, even for medieval executions, and raises questions. Why such thoroughness? Were they simply paranoid about her influence, or were they trying to destroy evidence of something else that happened during the execution? Since we only have the accounts of her enemies, and French supporters were kept at a distance, we may never know the full story. The absence of authentic remains means we can never conduct DNA analysis to answer these questions. We cannot confirm her ancestry, her health, or even the precise details of her death. The terrifying truth is that Joan of Arc was erased from physical existence more completely than almost any other major historical figure. The scientific analysis confirmed that the supposed relics of Joan of Arc were a clever fake, constructed from ancient Egyptian mummy parts. While this solves one mystery, it opens up many others. The real Joan of Arc left no physical trace. Her DNA is lost to the river, scattered six centuries ago. We are left with only the historical record, documents written mostly by her her enemies or by witnesses recalling events decades later. In a way, the exposure of the fake relics makes Joan's story even more powerful. Without any physical proof of her existence, she becomes a figure of almost mythological stature. This seems fitting for a young woman whose life defied all ordinary explanation. The ashes in the jar may be fake, but the centuries of devotion, political maneuvering, and human longing they represent are very real. Joan of Arc's story survives not in bone or ash, but in the collective memory of a nation and the imagination of the world. The only proof we have of her is the undeniable fact that, 600 years later, we are still searching for the truth about the 19-year-old girl who changed history before vanishing into flame and water. What are your thoughts on this revelation about Joan of Arc? Are there other historical mysteries that fascinate you? Let us know in the comments section.